Bonjour, ça va? Uh, je suis désolé, je n'ai pas la parole française. Uh, maintenant, je parle anglais. Merci beaucoup. So, uh, I just speak some French. <laughs> Uh, I'm a PhD student of Nicolas Gillies. Uh, we are working in a Mons, that is the southern French-speaking part in Belgium. So today I'm going to talk about NMF. So what is NMF? Very simple. You are given X and R, which is a matrix and a rank, a factorization rank. And what you want to find is to find two things, W and H, that means the variable or factorization matrices that this equality is true. The important thing is this is non-negative matrix factorization. So everything is non-negative, meaning that the elements in the W and H and also X are all non-negative. That means only zero or positive is allowed. This problem, there is an equality. That means this is an exact factorization problem, is a hard problem. And you may wonder, what about approximate? That means replacing this exact inequality into an approximate. And the problem is, when you talk about this, you will need to know what is the R. Assume now the R is called low rank. That means the inner structure is smaller than the X itself. So this is called approximate NMF for low rank. This problem is an approximate problem. You can solve it by as, a, as an optimization problem, like this. This is a minimization problem with constraint that, number one, this has to be non-negative, and this means uh, elementary-wise, that means none of them can be negative. And in this case, this is a F norm for BNS norm. You can use other things, for example, KL divergence, uh, one norm, nuclear norm, blah, blah, blah. But here, I will just consider F norm for simplicity. Everything I talk here, if the norm is, a, is a really a distant function, then applies. And unfortunately, this is also a bad problem or hard problem. Because, uh, first of all, this is a non-convex problem, and also this is an ill post problem. So the focus of this talk will be try to twist this problem a little bit. This is NMF with a star that promotes some structure. Now that means you are escaping the original problem. The problem is hard, but you don't solve it. You solve an alternative problem. And this star promotes some specific structure. For example, if there's no star, that is what I just talked. If the star is called something called separability, then the MP hardness of the problem can be handled. And to generalize separability, then you can consider something called minimum volume. And I know this is called sparse day, so you may wonder, what about if the star is some sparsity-inducing regularizer? Yes, you can do that, but I'm not going to talk about that. And in fact, no negativity will induce some sparsity. So is sparsity really needed? Uh, yes, you can do that, but I would say uh, not necessary. So this slide is to say why NMF is important. For me, there are four reasons, and I think the last one is the most important. And now I'm going to give you an example on number one and number two to explain why NMF is a very, very meaningful problem. It's not just come up from nowhere. This is an example called hyperspectral imaging example. To make it simple, you have some data. This is called a hyperspectral data, so it's an image. So normally when you're talking about image, you take a photo using a camera, you are talking about the image with respect to wavelength that is uh, visible light. That means red, green, blue. But hyperspectral image means you take the photo in X-ray, gamma ray, radio wave, etc. So you are having multiple images of the same scene. In this example, what you want to do is you have this as an observable data, what you want is to decompose it into meaningful components. For example, here you can see you have a scene. You will hypothesize, in fact, this scene is, consists of some fundamental structure. For example, row, grass, tree, water, wood top. If you look at the decomposition here, you can see the white part, that means the high concentration, is in fact the row. 
here is a grass or tree, and here are the root pot. So what is happening? You have some sunlight from the sun, and then you hit the grass. Because of the chemical structure of the grass, the reflected spectra, that means here is the chemical behavior of the, towards the light, it looks like this, and this is for the row. And let's say you have a picture that is 40% of row and 60% of grass, then you will hypothesize that, well, this will be 60% of the grass plus 40% of row. So this is so normal, naturally you will think about this. And this is in fact what NFF does. It just learned this. I repeat, this is what you have, and this is what NFF learned. Why NMF is important? Because you can see, first of all, spectra is non-negative. If you use a PCA, ICA, it gives you something with negative, then you cannot know what is it. If you use NMF, let's say you get this spectra, then what you do next? You go to data book and then see, oh, this is, looks like a tree spectra, then you know this is tree, or this is grass, so this is grass. So you can decompose it into interpretable and meaningful and useful thing. That means it's, it's not just a numerical decomposition like PCA. You have a question? Yes. Um, I understand the spectra tells me whether this looks like a grass, a road, and yes, negativity would um, make it harder. But once you compress it with NMF, let's say instead of having a million dimensions, now I have a thousand dimensions, does this even look like the same spectra anyway? Can I even still say that it looks like grass by Okay, by you are talking about something that is, uh, can be solved by something called hierarchy NMF. In fact, this assumption means that in the whole picture, there are only one kind of grass. Maybe you can have different kind of trees and different kind of grass. Then the spectrum will have little bit different. What your problem is, Let's say there are many components and the data point is so big and then you decompose it or compress it into this kind of fundamental component. Is it really true that I can differentiate different kind of grass among the grass? Mm -hmm. And I would say uh, this is possible, but this is out of the scope of my work because now I'm considering uh, a simple illustrative example and what you are asking can be solved by something called hierarchy NMF, but uh, this is uh, out of the scope now. So the last example is just to try to in convince you NMF is a good problem, important problem, funny problem. And if you are not convinced, that, then you can look at this slide. It just tells you three things. Number one, there are many applications can be related to NMF, and that is a good thing for application scientists. If you are like me, working from the mathematical point of view, if you want to prove P equal MP, you can work on it because this is related. Of course, this is a very, 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 very difficult problem. So what I just discussed is the introduction of NMF, that means what is NMF. And I hope I just convinced you NMF is an interesting and problem to study. So now I will working to the separable NMF. So first look at the problem NMF. So what is NMF? NMF tells you a picture of a cone. Why? Let's say you have data point. Don't forget, this non-negative, so this data point only exists in the non-negative orphan. In this example, it's a 3D case, and I have the blue dots here. What is the NMF? NMF say that the x, that means the data point, equal to w and h. So, what is h? h is coefficient. As you remember, everything is non-negative. So, that means this linear combination now become convex combination, because your coefficient can only be zero or larger than zero, so you have a cone. And if your cone are compressed, then you have a convex hull. Algebraically speaking, that means this H is not just a conical combination, but a convex combination, meaning that the coefficients are normalized, that means sum to one, so you have a convex hull. So now here comes the funny thing. If you stand here and look at this cone in front of it, you will see a triangle. So what is NMF? Very simple. You have this data point. That means the right figure is what you have. You have a bunch of points. And don't forget, this is 3D point, not 2D point. You are just looking at this angle, but in fact, there are 3D points. And the problem of NMF is very simple. Geometrically speaking, you have this, you try to find a triangle. That means you either find a green triangle or you find a red point. So in fact, the geometry of NMF means 
is a finding vertices problem. So what is the algebra expression of what I just said? Notice that these three extreme points are bigger. What I mean here is, if you try to find the vertices of these dots, or these points, and such that, oh, interestingly, in fact, the vertices exist among these dots, then your W, that means the variable matrices, in fact, is a certain column of X. J here is an index set telling you which column in X is, in fact, the vertices. Of course, you don't know J. That's why you have to find a J. And in this structure, you will have this specific structure on an H. So let's look at this as an example. For example, this is data matrix X. And you are now approximate using W and H. Now what I told you is that this W is so funny, they, they actually come from certain column from X. So I just draw you the corresponding co lines. Because this free column can sp span this free specific data column, so the corresponding coefficient is a 0, 1, 0, or 0, 0, 1. And if you put a permutation matrix on this edge, then you can form an identity matrix. So that means this is the algebraic expression of a, something called separable NMF. So what is the geometry? Again, you have this as a given point. Don't forget this is 3D point. And what you want to find is the vertices. So that means you are now changing the problem of a factorization into a geometric problem, finding vertices from the cloud. And this is now trivially not MP hard name anymore and solvable and there are a bunch of algorithm exists. And why this is called separable? Because some big name call it separable, so that's why. <laughs> And actually, you have other names, but anyway. So what I just told you is the problem description. But if you cast this as an optimization program, then it looks like this ugly. So this means this is NMF without anything I just mentioned to you. Don't forget, this has to be non-negative. And then this means the vertices are inside the data point, And this is the structure of H. And this means column of H sum to 1. That means normalization. And in fact, there is a many algorithm. I just tell you a very simple algorithm. This is from my boss. And first of all, you find the point with the largest norm. Why? Because extreme point will have largest norm. This is trivial. And what you do next, you project the other point into the orthogonal complement subspace of this point, something as simple as that. Then you repeat this R time. And each time, you have one new point. Then after R step, you have all the R extreme point. Then you get a W. What about H? You have X and W. Then you just do a regression. Of course, this is non-negative. That's why, non-negative this square, or whatever you want to do. And I will say this is the best method among all the methods in this problem. Because, number one, it has theoretical guarantee that you can find the ground truth if these conditions hold. Well, this mathematics just means this English sentence. If noise is bounded, that means blah, blah, blah then worst case fitting error is bounded, which is common sense. This mathematics is just to make a more precise description of this English statement. And this method is also fast. Why? Because this is a modified gram, gram GS iteration. Well, I know some of the thicker we're talking about some fast operation. Then if I incorporate them, then it will become, it will become even more faster. And computing H is just a normal, it's just an optimization problem. Then you can do something that is optimal. For example, UE Nestor-Royce acceleration on a projected gradient is the fastest ever, and you can just apply it. And this method can achieve both. That means fast and robust at the same time. This is very important. If you have a method that is fast but it's not accurate, then what you do is a waste of time because you compute garbage. If you have a method that is robust, good, but if your method run takes 1,000 1, years, that is also practically garbage because you cannot run it. And this is a very fast and robust method. That's why I say this is the best. However, this method wins, but it has an assumption. If you want to attack a thing with a mathematical proof, that means everything here logically sounds. The way you can attack it is to attack the assumption. What is the assumption? The vertices are inside that point. What if this is false? So this comes to the part three. That means what I work. 
the situation is now the same. Let's say you have three points, and now the coefficient h is not one. That means the largest value of the h or all the h i j is bounded by some number. The red points here are the ground truth. That means the the vertices that generate all the data points here, and the blue one is in fact the result from S P A. And you can see if the points are further further away from the vertices, S P A fails. Well, this is common sense. Then the problem is how to solve it. Okay, here comes a funny, interesting animation. Ooh. Okay, this is the. Wow. Too bad. Okay, this is the thing. I can explain it now. Uh, suppose you have data with this structure. That means you are assuming your data has some ground truth W0 and H0. Well, this is 2D projection, but it can be any D. Then, and assume you have three point. This, in this case, is a triangle. If you have four point, five point, then you become a convex polygon. And now, in this example, I didn't add noise, so you have uh, this kind of thing as an observable data. Let's say your initialization gives you this uh, blue triangle. Geometrically speaking, what I do is very simple: fit the blue triangle to touch the red triangle, and. What I'm going to show you in this animation is, in fact, this blue triangle will converge to the red triangle, even the point that is close to the extreme point are hidden. So this is a very powerful method because number one, it generalizes the previous cases because in the previous cases it means the data points are fully distributed in the entire red triangle. So you are using the points to. Infer this free red point. Now my points are not fully distributed, but partially, and you are still able to find the free red points.、Uh, too bad the, the the GIF does not work, but it, it, it will work anyway. So maybe I go to a slide. Okay. Oh yes. Okay, this is just one of the of the illustration, but it stopped the loading now. Anyway,、uh, it's working. You can see in this case the blue line is in fact the the trace of the point, and you can see it touch the red point eventually. But now I just、uh, stop at the middle because this GIF file is too big. So I think this gives you the idea what actually I'm working on is a fitting problem. But I working on it as an optimization problem, and it has such good geometric、uh, interpretation. So this is for three point in dimension three. What have what if you have more points? You have the same idea. You will have a convex polygon. What if you are in four D, five D, six D, blah 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 D? You will have a convex polytope, and everything is the same. So this applies for higher dimension. But for simplicity, I just talk about two-dimensional case for easy understanding. So, what is the problem in an optimization sense? You have this thing. Without the lambda v, then this is NMF, as usual. With this v, is some function that measure the volume of a convex hull or convex polytope. And this is a prox function. That means approximation. Because if you really know, try to figure out the volume of a convex polytope, which is a very, very, very difficult problem. So people come up with some approximator. For example, this. For example, determinant, log determinant, and a rectangular box and nuclear number. So why these are related to volume? I can give you a very short、uh, illustration. Because determinant of a matrix is the product of Eigenvalue or singular value, then that means this is the volume of the ellipsoid of the matrix. So this is something related to volume, and you have a log. That means you try to make sure the volume, the diagonal of all the ellipsoid of the ellipsoid along all direction are equally distributed or contributing to the volume. Because in the determinant case, if you have a very very flat ellipsoid, then the eigenvalue along the long Axis will dominate, and which is numerically speaking not good. So there are some、uh, theoretical guarantee, which is called sufficient scattered condition. But because of time, I don't have the time to talk about it. And 
Two days ago, in fact, I just presented a paper in another conference on, on this problem, on which volume function is better. And the open, unsolved problem is, again, you have to derive a fast and robust algorithm on this thing. Again, if your method is fast but not robust, that means if your method is robust, it's okay for small problem but not okay for big problem. So, this is our final slide. That is what I didn't talk about yet. First of all, I didn't talk about how actually to solve it. That is how to solve this problem. No, don't forget this is a non-convex optimization problem. And if you have some funny constraint or your function is not differentiable, blah, 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 then you have lots of things to do. So I didn't talk about how to solve it, actually. And for those interested, you can look at the paper. And I can tell you this is the fastest up to now in the world. And then this is a regulated problem. Then you will wonder, as a machine learning scientist, you will ask how to tune number. In fact, there are a lot of tricks to do that. And finally, for more funny things, for example, this kind of thing can be extended to a tensor. And you can do the same thing on the tensor fiber. And you can also incorporate sparsity compressed sensing to it. And you can do other things and even solve a super big problem in computer science. So lastly, this is the last page. I just summarized what I just said. What is NMF? What is the geometry? What is the problem that's solved? And what up to now is the minimum volume. And this is the end of the presentation. Thank you, merci beaucoup. Uh, if you, if you, okay. Well, if you can solve exact NMF in a, in a certain way, then this problem will relate to the free set problem, and then you can prove exponential time hypothesis, and then you can prove P equal, not equal MP, blah, blah, blah. But this talk is uh, about sparsity, not about theoretical computer science. So if you want to talk about that more, we can talk about it offline. Of course, don't, don't expect I can solve this. Of course, this is too difficult. Yeah. I think this is harder than Raymond hypothesis. <laughs> Another one. Um, so I work in a division with a lot of science, domain scientists. And one problem with NMF is computer scientists and applied mathematicians define an objective function, Frobenius theorem, k divergence, you name it. And nobody in science cares about them. They care about what they get in the output, and someone looks at it, actually a consortium of these guys look at it and say, this doesn't make sense, and this one that makes sense. And when I tell them about these algorithms, all they say is, it's not giving me what I want to see. Instead, I came up with this other NMF algorithm. Because it's ill-posed, you can essentially solve it many different ways. And now there's this whole group of non-computer scientists writing PNAS papers about their own methods of solving NMF problem. I mean, I, I don't like it because it's kind of doesn't have a handle to it. Um, but what do you think this is? This field is going. Is it going to be like a domain scientist doing their own algorithms and computer scientists optimizing their own objective function? Uh, you have uh, raised a very, 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 very important problem, and I agree to your statement. What you are going to say that it is. There are two groups of people. One is uh, focused on mathematics, more theoretic oriented, and then there's a second group of people focusing on application. And these two groups of people never communicate with each other. And I can tell you this is absolutely the true in MMF. For example, I just been a conference on the applied side two days ago, and what you said is true. They just create a bunch of NMF problem and they create their own method and own performance criterion that makes no sense. And in fact, their method only wins if, if using their own performance indices. So I would say to make it a fair judgment, for example, in this figure, what I'm trying to say, you are trying to fit a model. But usually you fit model, you are talking about data fitting. Here, it's not just about fitting the data X, but I'm also fitting the ground to W. That is, if you can fit a data X, that means you have some W and H fit a data X. But I can always come up with 
another W and H such that the fitting, the norm is the same because this is a non-convex problem with many local minimum. So the point is, if you want to think about this problem, you should think about global minimum. And that means for application purpose, if they cannot prove that their method converge to a global minimum for a non-convex problem, then I will say they don't have theoretical ground, then I will say their method does not sound to me. And I have to tell you, for example, for convergence proof algorithm, in fact, there is a big name in Toulouse University make an algorithm called PALM. That is the first proven conversion algorithm for a non-convex, non-smooth problem, which I study very hard. Yeah. And before that paper appeared, none of the paper can make a sound theoretical proof. And so I would say uh, this is an unhealthy thing. So I will say I hope in the future people can get in touch with each other. Because for the applied people, they will say that, oh, your paper is too theoretical. I can't read it. And then for the theoretical people say, I don't know what you are doing on the data. I think this is bad because if you talk about mathematical data science, then these have two terms, mathematical and science. So these two have to be come together and not just two of them playing separately. Yeah. I think there's a theme coming in here, and I can see it maybe recurring again. Uh, and that was a great question and a great answer. And uh, yeah, uh, I can see things shaping up very nicely. Uh, so I, th I think at this point, we'll thank you again for the talk.